One of my favourite trips when I grew up in the East End of London was to visit the Tower of London. The guns and the armour and the tales of the beef eaters were interesting, but seeing the crown jewels was the highlight. They seemed to me then a treasure beyond imaginings. But as I grew older, I began to understand a whole lot more about money and treasure that was going to be necessary to rebuild the country after World War II. Even if the crown jewels were sold today, their estimated commercial value would be between three to five billion pounds. A lot of money, but our national debt these days far outweighs that. It stands at about 1.8 trillion pounds. Western society particularly seems to be preoccupied with money. As we move further and further away from God, we see what Jesus meant in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Loving money, or anything else for that matter, that we treasure more than God, is our problem. That's not to say having money is wrong in itself. The Bible actually says the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. Money can be used to alleviate poverty, create work, finance the research into finding a vaccine for COVID-19 and a host of other things. It's the love of money that is a root of all kinds of evil. Jesus spoke about money quite a bit, but more about the kingdom of God. He wanted us to understand that real treasure is stored in heaven, not in a bank. He said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. And here's the punchline. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Material gain does seem to be high on the list of priorities for a lot of people. We seem to set our heart on money rather than worshipping and serving the one who created all things material. The National Lottery, or Lotto, as it's known today, is run by Camelot. And from 2010, Camelot has actually been owned by the Ontario Teachers' Pension Plan from Canada, who bought it for £389 million. A friend of mine, rather mischievously, takes each letter of Camelot to stand for calling all mugs, enter loads of times. Originally, the tagline was, it could be you. And technically, it could be you. If you bought a ticket, as they used to say, you've got to be in it to win it, which is also true. But what are the odds of winning? The odds of being struck by lightning in the UK are around 1 in 1 1.2 million. The odds of winning the lotto jackpot are 1 in 45 million. And the Euro Millions jackpot, 1 in 139 million. What is it that motivates a person who wouldn't dream of backing a horse whose odds of winning were set at, say, 450 to 1, and yet buys a ticket every week with odds against winning of over 
45 million to one. Of course, there are charities who benefit from these lotteries and maybe people give to some degree because of them. But surely the person really hopes to win big bucks too. The book of Proverbs says, wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. How many articles have you read about lottery winners who have lost a lot within a few years? Recently, I, I heard a, a variation on the old adage, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. It went like this, a proverb a day keeps the devil away. Because there are 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs, some people read one chapter for every day and they know where they are in the month and they find the book of Proverbs life-changing. If money is our treasure, then we should remember what Paul wrote to Timothy. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. We've all noticed that wealthy people got lots of money, but they, e they want even more money than they've got. But craving for money is evident in the poor too. It's where our priorities are that really matters. Remember what Jesus said? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Talking of treasures, Captain, or should I say now, Honorary Colonel Tom Moore has become a national treasure and has quite rightly received the praise and admiration of the nation for his selfless acts of walking a hundred laps of his home. And he's raised nearly £33 million for the NHS the last time I checked. When I was a child, Another Tom Moore used to come to our church to hold children's missions. Uncle Tom, as we called him, had a very gracious way of talking about the greatest treasure anyone can have, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I came home from the mission on the 18th of May 1949 knelt by my bedside and asked the Lord to forgive my sins and come into my life. Uncle Tom was not famous, but his life influenced thousands for Christ. He led my mother and father to the Lord, my sister too, and amazingly, before I ever knew her, my wife-to-be, Jan, who lived on the other side of London. Has there been a time in your life when you surrendered your eternal future to Christ? God tells us that in his presence there is fullness of joy and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. That's the ultimate treasure. Treasures we have here on earth are likely to fade reduce in value, get stolen or destroyed. But treasure in heaven never gets corrupted, is safe and eternal. A rich young man came to Jesus wanting eternal life. And during the discussion, the Lord made it obvious to him that he loved his money more than his God. Go, Sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, said Jesus. And come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. I do hope that that young man 
changed his mind later in his life. The words of Jesus ring true today. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in return for his soul?